Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Klaus Aranha from the University of Scuba, and we are going to now to continue Experiment Designs for Computer Science, Lecture 5, uh, Part 2. And we are going to talk about dealing with non-normal data. Uh, non normal data is at the same time something that uh, happened less often than we think and more often than we think. So let's try to explain that in, the, in this lecture. Wait. So until now, uh, we studied methods that assume that the experimental data comes from uh, the, the parameter that we are interested in comes from a normal distribution or something close enough, okay? But in some cases, this assumption does not hold. So how can we perform the statistical analysis of the results in these cases? Let's start with a simple example to show that sometimes no normality can creep in and takes us by surprise, okay? So imagine that we have a researcher that is examining two different diets, diet A and diet B. Okay, and the researcher wants to compare uh, the weight loss. So he measures people for a week or a month and um, measures how many, how, how much weight they lost. And they wrote it on a, on a data, on a data set actually. So that A, they followed some people. It got four, three, zero, minus three, minus five, 11, minus 14, minus 15, minus 300. And diet B, we got minus eight, minus 10, minus 16, minus 21, minus 24. So as we, if we take a look at this data, and it's good to always take a look at your data before you start doing tests. Uh, you might notice some very interesting things. Uh, the test, uh, I, have many, I have seen many students of my laboratory and of all the laboratories that they focus so much on the result of the test that they forget to look at the entire data. And that may result in a kind of a tunnel, tunnel vision, right? If we look at this test, we can, if you look at this data, we can see two things right away. It seems that in general, the values of diet B are lower. It seems like that. I mean, most of the values in, in the, in the highest value of diet B is minus eight. And that's quite, that's lower than the median of diet A. But on diet A, we got this weird value in the end, minus 300. Now, what is this minus 300? Well, I did not collect the data, so I don't know. It could be someone that really, really got really thin during the, the time. It could be that the person who was entering the data typed an extra zero in there. It could be an error in the measurement. It could be that uh, the person did not, the, the, the data was uh, done correctly, but the balance was broken or it may be a true data, I don't know, okay? So, but it's a big outlier. And we're gonna see that if we try to visualize, if we try to do a box plot of both datas, um, and we have a hint here of what's going to happen. If we just call the box plot on both data sets, we're gonna get a graph like this. And in this graph, well, we can see the difference, but it looks quite close. Now, if we remove and here's the outlier, minus 300. If we remove this outlier and plot this again, we see that the two data compared, we see this difference. So I guess you can kind of see where I'm going over here. So this outlier is going to change how the statistic function looks at the data. So let's see what happens with the t-test. So when we look at the result of the t-test, we can see that we have a t-test, two sample t-test, our t-value is minus 0 0.5. And if you remember your, the, the test that we did before, and if you did some tests by yourself, you can see that this is actually a quite middle way in the t-distribution. So with 90 degrees of freedom, our p-value is 0 0.6. So if we just do the t-test on these two data sets, we cannot reject uh, the new hypothesis that they might be the same. And this goes a little bit against what we're looking at. I mean, even if, even if they were not as, even if there was not a significant difference, we would not expect such a high p-value. If we look at the, and, and we, when we look at the confidence interval, and this is why it's important to look at the confidence interval. When we look at the confidence interval, we see that 
okay? The estimated value of the difference goes from minus 82, minus 82 to plus 50. If we try to plot this, uh, if we try to plot this standard deviation here, minus 82 to plus 50, we see that the confidence interval of the difference is higher, is bigger than the entire data that we're looking at. So this tells us that there's something wrong. Okay, it's not even just the p-value, just the confidence interval. Look at the confidence interval and compare the confidence interval with the values that you actually have. You see, hey, there's something wrong here. Okay. All right. So what happens? How do we deal with this? Okay. So in here, it's clear that the case, by the way, the problem here is that if you remember, the t-test is based on calculating the mean. What happens to the means when we have a big outlier, okay? So for instance, if you studied uh, a little bit of social, social science, you see that you don't want to take the mean of something like the salary. If you take the mean of the salary of the population of a country, this mean will be much higher than the salary that a lot of people receive because you have very few people with very large fortunes that will be outliers. So you have like maybe 1% of the people that have 80% of the, the value uh, in, some, in, in some country. And if you just take an average of how much money everyone have, these outliers will pull the average much higher than what's reasonable. And that's the same thing that's happening here. So if we know that the outlier is an experimental error, if we know that, oh, the balance was broken or the person wrote it wrong, well, I mean, we saw the outlier, we saw that the outlier is uh, affecting our results, we can go and just remove the outlier, okay? On the other hand, maybe we don't know, maybe the outlier is some important effect worth of being investigated. If this is a diet, maybe we can see that the outlier is a special case where the diet has some serious side effect. And then we want to know how often does this special case happen? We just tested 10 people. If we test 100 people, we will see this outlier happening more often. So the outliers may be either errors that should be discarded, or they may indicate special effects that should be studied. And there is no formula to tell you that. You have to do that by using your knowledge of the experiment that you are conducting. If we don't know, we can also use some test that is not sensitive to the outliers. So uh, we're gonna talk a little bit more about this later, but a non-parametric test is a test that you, does not use a distribution uh, defined by parameters, okay? It's a position, it's a relative position test. So if we use a non-parametric test for this data, this test will correctly indicate a rejection of the new hypothesis of equality. So here we're using the Wilcox test that we are going to describe. And the Wilcox test among the two data, we can see that the Wilcox test gives us a p-value of 0 0.01. So it indicates a true location shift. So what is a true location shift? A true location shift means that the median of these two values, it has a real shift. It's not on the same location. These two values are not equivalent one of the values has a shift in position with the others. Now, one thing that we can see here is that the result of the Wilcoxon test will not give us a confidence interval and will not give us a central value that we can say, oh, this is the delta that we are looking at. So the Wilcoxon test gives us less information than the t-test. So it's a trade-off. The Wilcoxon test is not uh, sensitive to these outliers but it's going to give us less information about what, is actually what it is actually testing. And when we explain the Wilcox test, you understand why this happens. All right, so let's go a little bit ahead. Um, so, um, how can uh, some data violate the assumption of normality? Uh, I'm highlighting here four types, okay? So for instance, like we saw before, sometimes we have special observations in the data that break 
uh, the assumptions of normality that the test makes. So for instance, very big outliers or data collection errors. And sometimes it's not as easy. Like if you have 10 data points, you can find an outlier easily, especially if the outlier is 100 times bigger than the rest of the points. But that's not always the case, okay? Now, another case, another special case that is also for special illustrations is one comment that was raised by one of the students in this course in the video comment from last class. And the student was saying, oh, I am measuring a time. Uh, so he was measuring, I, 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 he did not say exactly what he was measuring, but he was measuring time. And if you measure time, you can have something like one second, two seconds, 0 0.5 seconds, 0 0.3 seconds, time from the beginning of an experiment. And when he calculates the, uh, the, the confidence interval, he saw that the confidence interval went into values that are lower than zero. And he asked me, how do you interpret that? Okay, how do you interpret when the confidence interval includes values that are less than zero? Well, there are two answers to this question. The first question, the first answer is that we can look at the back to the future movies and imagine that we found a way to go back in time. The real answer is that this distribution is not really normal. So let me just pause real quick for a sneeze. <coughs> okay, I could not pause, okay. Um, all right, sorry about that. So when we have a normal distribution that is limited on one of the sides, well, sorry, when we have a distribution when leaving the other side, the distribution will look like this. So all these values under the zero, they are not they are not allowed. So this is not really a normal distribution, right? Um, it does not have the same properties as the normal distribution. So in this case, actually using a confidence interval is not correct. The confidence interval will give us wrong information. So this is a case, like if we have uh, values that are close enough, okay, if we have values that are close enough to an absolute limit and a normal distribution will describe values that go across the, this limit, then this is an evidence that these values don't actually come from a normal distribution. They come from some different distribution that obeys this absolute limit. So we cannot use techniques based on normal distribution here because of this, okay? Now, um, this is similar to the second condition, which are extreme non-normal distributions. So we have, for instance, the power distribution and the Cauchy distribution, they are very non-normal. And if you try to apply normal methods on this, you're gonna get wrong results. Now, both of these cases, we still have standard numerical data. Now, in some experiments, we have what we call ordinal data. So ordinal data is data that we can compare and compare it by some criteria, but we cannot apply traditional algebra on it. And a very good example, we're gonna talk about, give a little bit more description later, is subjective scores. If you have some data, for instance, let's say that you're measuring an app, and this app, you're gonna rate, hate other people, and when you're rating them, you give them a score between one and five stars. Now, if you give it to, this, to many people, and they start to give one to five star scores to people. Well, first we have this absolute limit that we we're talking before. We have no value lower than zero stars and no value higher than five stars. So this already indicates that uh, maybe a normal distribution is not a very good fit here. But more than that, what is the difference between five stars and four stars? What is the difference between four stars and three stars? If I'm counting seconds, okay, four seconds is double of two seconds is four stars double than two stars? Is someone that received, like if you rate a, an application with four stars, is that application two times as good as an application with two stars? Well, no, that makes no sense, right? Because this is ordinal data, this is not numerical data. You cannot apply algebra here and expect the values to make sense. So this is a problem. And finally, we have completely no numerical data. In some cases, we don't, because you, you can still say that four stars is better than two stars. You cannot say that it's two times as, as good as two stars, but you can say it's better.
But what if you're testing for colors? You want to see if people wear more blue shirts or red shirts or white shirts, and your data is blue, red, white. Now your data is not even numeric. You cannot even say blue is bigger than red, red is bigger than white. So you have a problem here. So you have to think about how you're gonna deal with this data. So let's see some examples. We're not, deal, we're not see all the examples to do all of this, but we're gonna see some of this. Okay, so let's talk about sources, how this non-normal data search uh, appear, right? So random processes in nature, so when we look at the nature and we see random process for nature, like a plant growing or shell forming or height in animals or size of animals, it's interesting that we often see these random process follow our normal distribution, okay? Uh, on the other hand, we, there are many random artificial processes that do not follow this normal distribution. For example, if we go to computer programs uh, and from computer programs that use random number generators, most times these random number generators will use a uniform distribution. We say, give me some value between one and a hundred, give me some value between zero and one. And you say, okay, uh, I'm using, I'm, I have a game here and this game will generate values between zero and one. And every time this value is above 0 0.7, my character takes some damage. Okay, so this is a uniform distribution. A uniform distribution is not a normal distribution. However, because of the CLT, the, the central limit theorem that we studied before, if we do many samplings from the normal distribution and we average these samplings, the result will be approximately normal for very small numbers of samples. Like if we sample, we get a, a uniform distribution and we sample three or four times, the sampling mean the, the, dis, the distribution of the sampling mean will actually be quite close to normal, okay? On the other hand, there are some distributions that are much farther away. And one of them is the power distribution, which is a distribution that happens very often. It happens when we're talking about for salaries, as we said before, and also it's a distribution that happens when we're talking about social networks. So in these cases, um, we're gonna have these binomial or power distributions that are very far away from normal. So it's important to know what kind of situations uh, they will uh, generate these non-normal distributions. So just going ahead. Now, another case is like I said before, uh, the cases of uh, subjective values. So this is, oh, there is a name for those data, it's called Likert data. So Likert data is the data that you often see collected from surveys and interview questions, usually composed of some multiple questions to say, oh, um, I like ice cream. And you have to mark strongly agree or strongly disagree. And like we said before, uh, these data will not be normal because first values beyond the minimum and maximum value, they have no mean. And algebra also has no mean. Like we said about four stars being double two stars. And here also, if you have neutral and disagree, what is neutral plus disagree? You cannot do algebra on these values, okay? Now, uh, when our data is not normal, what can we do? There are some strategies uh, that we can think about uh, to when our data is not normal. And the first strategy, surprising a lot, is just to do nothing. So for instance, we can remove some outliers that break the normality, as we saw in the first example, or we can also trust that our test will be robust enough for small deviations of normality. And for many cases, uh, this is actually quite enough. Uh, like we saw, I think, in the very first example of a t-test, uh, if, if the data has some deviation for normality, then that's fine. Of course, this is some deviation from normality. It's not like completely no normal data or even, even no numerical data. If the data is like a data, doing a t-test on like a data does not make a lot of sense. Well, we can also transform the data. So there are some transformation techniques that can be used to get a data that is not normal and transform it into normal data. And finally, as we saw in the first example of this lecture, uh, we can also use non-parametric testing. So non-parametric testing are, are statistical tests that do not make the assumptions of normality on the sampling distribution. And there are more solutions. 
So that if your data has some special characteristics, it's worth looking for a statistics book that will guide you on how to perform your data or even talk to a statistics professional. Uh, different tests require different, different experiments require different tests, require different statistics. So make sure that you know uh, what data you're dealing with and what are its characteristics. So let's talk a little bit about transformations. So for instance, uh, transformations are just apply some function to the data. So we can have, for example, the, nor the log transformation. If we have some data that follows a log normal distribution like this, if we apply the log to a log normal distribution, the values will follow a normal distribution, okay? This is how you would apply. So we can get the R norm, a random normal, and we can take Y will be the log of C, and we can do the log transformation, right? So if we do the exp uh, exponential of normal, we're gonna have Z is a log normal distribution. And if we take the log of C, we have a normal distribution with mean Y and standard deviation, okay? Now, uh, another thing, transformation that we have is when the data has a lot of skew. So skew uh, is when the data has a bigger error to one side than to the other. So for instance, if we have some data like this, and our mean is here, then we have a smaller uh, error here, but a larger error here. In cases like this, we can use a uh, transformation to remove the skew of the data. The skew can shift the location of the norm, the mean in relation to based on the error. So it can cause standard statistical tests to give wrong results. So if the data is skewed to the left, we can do a square root transformation or a cube root transformation, and the data will go back to a normal with the same error on both sides. If the data is skewed to the right, we can do something like a square root transformation with a constant, or a cube transformation with a context. And then these roots, like um, the logarithm, like if we have negative data, we're gonna have no defined results. So we might have to add some constants here, okay? So this would transform the data and allows us to work our statistics on the transformed data. However, uh, it's important that when you transform the data and you do the statistics on the transformed data, your results are referred to the transformed data. So when you report these results on your paper or when you are describing making a plot, you must make it clear that you did the analysis on the transformed data. That might influence how people uh, um, understand uh, your results. So for instance, um, any transformation that you do on the data needs to be explained in your experimental design section of the paper or your report. Experimental design, we collect the data, we apply this transformation, and then we do this test on the transformed data. And when you discuss the results, you must go back to the original data. Like if A is bigger than B by some, 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 some certain delta that you decide, define it, what does this delta mean when you transform the data back to its standard values? Okay, so if you're saying that, okay, my result was at least this much difference, this was my uh, result of practical significance, this practical significance must be reported in the original data, not the transformed data. Just to give an example, if we do the, the, the mean of the log normal distribution includes the variance. So if we, however, when we do a transform it, when we take the log of that, the mean of the normal does not include the value of the variance. So in this case, uh, the new hypothesis on the transformed data will not be valid if the variance is not the same, because when you transform back, it will include the variance in the mean, okay? So you need to be careful when you are interpreting transformed data. Uh, another technique for, trans for obtaining normal distributions is to use bootstrapping. So bootstrapping is, in statistic is a procedure used to obtain an approximation of the sample mean distribution. 
Remember that when we were doing the analysis of the t-test in the third class, we said that the, the statistical test works on the sample mean distribution, which is the distribution of means of the sample, the distribution of the mean estimator. We estimated the mean of the population by taking the mean of the sample, and we, our test was about the, uh, the sampling mean, okay? And we can extract the sampling mean, the sampling distribution from, the, uh, from, our, uh, from our data. So following the properties of the central limit theorem, uh, we, can, we, can, we know that this, the sample mean distribution will usually follow a normal distribution, even when the underlying distribution of the observations is not normal. So what does that mean? So what is the bootstrapping procedure? So this is the bootstrapping procedure. First, we take an initial sample with M, or M observations. So this is the sample from our experiment. Now, from these M observations, we create N bootstrap samples. So we have our initial experiment with our sample with size M. And for each of these, we have N bootstrap with samples. And for each of these new samples, we have MB. So we have smaller resamples. And using these bootstrap resamples, we can do our bootstrap mean with the bootstrap distribution, which will follow a normal. Okay. So if we calculate the mean of each of these bootstrap samples, we, this mean we're gonna follow a bootstrap distribution which will be approximately normal. Let's see a clear example here. So this is, uh, we're doing bootstrap here using the boot package in R. So the boot package does bootstrapping, it calculates confidence intervals of bootstrap, it does statistical uh, uh, tests, the t-test and the z-test on bootstrap, so you can study this, the, this package to learn how to do all these things. Right now, we're gonna focus on just uh, the analysis of, the, uh, of creating the bootstrap sample. So here we have the city data set that measures, um, I forgot right now, but I think it's the density of the population, the size and the number of people, or the, uh, the number of people in some occurrence in the city. But what matters is that we have two values, u and x, and our value of interest is u divided by x. So here we are calculating the ratio that is u divided by x. And here is the value of this ratio. And you can see here that this is not a normal distribution, okay? We can take the, we can have one extremely high value and a bunch of values that follow what seems to be a uh, uniform distribution. So this is not normal. However, we can take the bootstrap. So by taking the bootstrap, we take the sample and we take 1,000 resamplings of this and we calculate the average of each of these resamples, okay? And when we do that, we see that our bootstrap distribution follows a normal distribution, okay? So the bootstrap distribution can be used to generate a normal distribution from a non-normal data set. Of course, the same thing for the other transformations apply you need to be clear, careful by describing that your statistical analysis is done on the bootstrap distribution and not on the regular distribution. All right. Now, <clears throat> what if we cannot or we don't want to transform the data? In that case, we can use non-parametric tests. The idea of non-parametric tests is that they use statistics Remember, statistics means functions on the data. So they use functions on the data that do not assume the normality of the population distribution. Uh, so when we have a test that assumes fewer things, these tests, they are usually weaker, okay? So we have weak assumptions. The weakest, if we assume less things, if we say, okay, any distribution can work on this test, this test will usually be less stronger. So non-parametric tests are usually less strong than parametric ones. Less strong means that uh, they will detect uh, smaller, they will be less sensitive to differences, and they will give us less information about the differences that we detect, okay? So 
for the, the, the non-parametric test, we have three uh, very classical tests. Uh, these are the uh, Wilcoxon signed rank test, which is a test for one sample. And then we have the Wilcoxon rank sum test that is for two samples. And we have the Kruskal-Wallis test that is for multiple samples. And we have not yet studied multiple samples, so we're not going to see this here. We're going to go back to the Kruskal-Wallis test when we studied uh, tests with uh, statistics with multiple samples. Okay. So, uh, let's see about the Wilcoxon test. So, the idea of the Wilcoxon test is that we want to calculate this U statistic, and the U statistic will give us the relationship between the positions. So, the U statistic is about the positions of two values. So, here we have two samples, okay? So we have the blue sample and the red sample, and we can see that the blue sample is ahead of every red sample. The second blue sample is ahead of two red samples, uh, is behind two red samples. The third blue sample is behind the three red samples, and the fourth blue sample is behind four blue samples, four blue. So our idea is, if we take the red and the blue, who is ahead of the other more often? Okay, so we just want to know the relative position of these two. If both, samples come from the same distribution, then they would be ahead of each other an equal number of times. However, if one of these distributions is more ahead of the other, we're going to see a shift between the order of the two samples. And the U statistic calculates this shift. Okay, so how do we calculate this? First, we calculate U and U prime. So we have U is this order. And u prime is u plus u prime is equal to the size of sample one times the size of sample two. So u is nine. We calculate the zero plus two plus three plus four, that's nine. However, we have a total of four on one and five or two, so this is 20. So u, u prime is u plus u prime equals to 20. So nine plus u prime is 20, so u prime is 11. So first, to calculate the statistic for the mann weekly test, the first thing we do is that we choose the smaller value. So between 9 and 11, the smaller one is 9. Now, our new hypothesis is that both samples come from the same distribution. And if both samples come from the same distributions, for a big enough n1 and n2, u will follow a normal distribution so we calculate this value of u, and although the, although the samples do not follow the normal distribution, this u that we calculated will follow a normal distribution. So u will follow a normal distribution with mean n1 times n2 divided by 2, so in this case with mean 10, and variance n1 times n2 uh, times n1 plus n2 plus 1 divided by 2. So we can calculate this variance and we can calculate this mean. Now, when we have this normal distribution, we can just calculate the Z statistic and we do a Z test of U with this distribution. Then we have the same statistics. So we can see here, we, when we have a norm normal, we calculate a statistic that follows a normal distribution and we use the traditional tests that we already know. Now, the Wilcoxon sign rank test is when we have a pair data. So if the data is unpaired, we compare everyone against everyone. When the data is paired, so we have two groups, let's say uh, weights or heights, okay? And these are paired. Let's say that it's the same people doing two different treatments before and after. And now what we do is that we compare plus and minus. So in here, the second group is bigger than the first one. So that's a plus. Here, the second group is smaller. So that's a minus. So that's a minus, that's a plus, that's a plus, that's a minus. So the Wilcoxon sign rank test will take the relative difference of pairs, how many plus and how many minuses we have. And the new hypothesis here is that the positive signs and the negative signs are equally likely. On the other hand, uh, so here we're going to compare the number of signs against a binomial distribution under the new hypothesis. So if we want to do the, uh, the, the same test, we can go straight to R. So here we have uh, these X and Ys are Hamilton and Wolf Hamilton data. So it's Hamilton depression scale. So they're 
nine people that they had in the first visit to the psychologist uh, or to the therapist, they give their uh, depression score. And in the second visit to the therapist, they give the, 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 their, uh, their depression score. So they compared the depression score before and that before the first visit and before the second visit, and they want to see if the therapy is having some success. So for each of them, they see if they improved or if they did not improve. So here we have the Wilcox test with X and Y, and we say it's paired because it's the same patient. And the alternative is that we want to see if the score becomes bigger. And when we see this, we see that the value is V is 30 and we are p-value zero one. So we have a true location shift that the second value uh, becomes uh, bigger. Okay. Sorry, uh, this first value is bigger. Okay. So to summarize this lecture, um, we can test for when we can test for equality. So if we want to test equality for two conditions. We test equality by establishing or minus delta and or plus delta. And we want to see if our experiment, if our sample is above, we test if the sample is above the minus delta and we test if the sample is below the plus delta. For no normality, there are several different cases such as outliers, data limits, ordinal data. And for small cases of no normality, we can just remove all liars or do a small transformation. If when we do transformation, we have bootstrapping. Bootstrapping is a good general technique for transformation. Uh, and if the transformation is not feasible, we can use non-parametric tests, such as the Wilcoxon rank sum or the, uh, the wilmet Mayu test to calculate the uh, changes in the central value of the data. So that finishes our class for today. I just want, I have one last thing to talk to you about. So if you remember from our um, schedule, our next class uh, will be a question and answer. So I would like to sit down with all of you who are taking this course. And I would like to have a session where you can ask me questions and I can answer the questions. I want also to talk a little bit about your reports. So I like to review the reports and show what the reports did right and talks about some common mistakes. Um, and also our TA will give an example of how you use the tests that we, already, we have already discussed on a real experiment in his research. So I would like everyone to participate, remi reminding you that our lecture happens from Friday it will be next Friday, uh, 3, 3.15 to about 6, okay? Uh, we can finish it early if there are not enough questions, uh, but everyone please come at this time. Now, this lecture will take the shape of a Zoom meeting. Uh, I will give you the information about the Zoom meeting on Manaba, so please uh, follow uh, the meeting. Uh, I'm sorry for those of you who are uh, following on YouTube, uh, but I don't know when you're seeing this, this video, so maybe it, it's already like many weeks after this, this class was given. But if you have questions, you can always send me a message or a comment. Okay, so I will send you the details for the meeting and I see you uh, next week. So uh, in here is some recommended reading. So I really, uh, would really like to suggest that if you want to know more about the quality testing or about uh, non-parametric testing, you take a good look. All of these texts are relatively short, uh, maybe four, five, six pages. Um, so it, some of them say why you should transform, some of them say when you should not transform. So I really recommend that you do some extra reading for this class. Thank you very much. And I see you uh, next week. Bye-bye.